for mm -hmm. us, it's building in a practice on a month by month basis. We treat the end of every month as important as the end of a quarter. And mm -hmm. so it kind of gives us on every quarter two dry runs of what's going on in the quarter. Well, my leadership philosophy, Josephine, is actually just being able to listen to understand, to always be curious, and I think to put people first, it's important. Mm, so listen, understand, and put people first. That's really cool. Okay, so let's move on to forecasting, which is the theme. What would you say the forecasting processes that you've built that have been instrumental in your forecast right now? Well... I'll break it down in two different ways. One is uh, things that I believe every forecasting model and probably company that is needing to forecast should follow. And then a few different items that I've added uh, in the last year that have made quite a difference in, in black lines processes. So number one is just to include metrics to your forecasting, like ensure that there's a measurable output not just that you are forecasting and going through the process, but that we're uh, measuring, you know, whatever the specific piece of the measurement is that's important to your team, include mm -hmm. that measurement uh, in, your, uh, in your expectations. That number two is it's a structured and repeatable um, process. And third is that you verbalize and reference uh, often your forecasting uh, requirements and the need of running the forecasts. The things that um, I have incorporated uh, in my own processes uh, as a sales leader um, is two different things. One is what we call a Bob review, and that's a it's an acronym, but the Bob is Book of Business, mm -hmm. and so it's an ability uh, for every sales rep to walk through their book of business for the given, uh, generally speaking, the given quarter. And so right now we're, you know, two weeks left in Q3. Uh, we're walking through the remaining opportunities that are sitting in people's books of business for Q3. But we're also now in this transition of, of preparing for Q4. And so when we walk into uh, our QBRs in, you know, three weeks from now, uh, I as a leader, a couple levels up from the field, will have an ability to talk to my executive management uh, with certainty as to, what's coming down the pike. And it's mainly because I'm listening firsthand to a weekly cadence of what's going on with my team and their specific deals and allowing me to ask questions along the way. The second piece of that is forecasting summaries, which is, uh, it's basically my front uh, first level team management uh, submitting forecasts kind of outside of a CRM environment, but mm -hmm. it puts it in a succinct fashion that is uh, rolling up data on a monthly basis, uh, and we're comparing uh, a committed level, a best case level, and what we call a gut feel as well. And so uh, they're taking data from the reps, they're creating their own forecast, which should be in sync with the reps. And then I'm reviewing their data in the succinct um, format that allows me to then roll it up to my SGBP. Mm, brilliant. Okay. So Larry, I know you probably might have touched on this, but what would you say the three most important things that you're looking to achieve from forecasting are? The first one's predictability of mm -hmm. your business. Uh, the second one is from a, a black line perspective, it's removing slippage. So mm -hmm. you know, in our environment, it we could look at different data that would say, you know, these opportunities have slipped um, 10 different times. And it's like, wow, that's an awful lot. Like, why have we been missing the mark so often? And so part of my personal um, attack on our forecast is to ensure that we don't have slippage, that we're not wasting time, you know, in sales cycles that aren't appropriately staged. And then second or third is just building in a practice. For us, it's building in a practice on a month by month basis. We treat the end of every month as important as the end of a quarter. And mm -hmm. so it kind of gives us on every quarter two dry runs of what's going on in the quarter. And then the third one is 
you know, this is live. We need to be uh, very tightly honed in on what's going on and, and ensure success. Mm. And so like, that's why you, you're able to have these conversations is because the process, you do this weekly, you're able to like dig in into actually what's going on. Yeah, that's right. That makes sense. Okay. And um, how do you define success in your forecasting, Larry? I had mentioned before using metrics. And mm -hmm. so within Blackline, we have two metrics uh, for every quarter. Mm -hmm. And it starts out with at week two, we kind of snap a chalk line that says your commit level for this quarter at week two is X. And then fast forward that eight weeks at week 10, you're snapping another chalk line of what your commit is mm. for the quarter. So, you know, each and every week we uh, run a forecast at all levels of the organization. And so at week two, we wanna be within 80% accuracy of what we end up at at the end of the quarter. At week 10, we want to narrow that even more to a 90% accuracy. So, you know, ultimately, if we're if we're a long ways off, mm -hmm. that's super bad thing in our world. Like our forecast is to build in predictability. And so if we're wildly off, it means we're not being predictable with our business. So ultimately, and it's not just for our own sales team, but it's for our upper management. And because we're a publicly owned organization now, it goes out to the street. So we want to be a predictably um, a predictable organization. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. So Larry, could you talk me through how deep in the organization do you look at your forecasting? And do you feel like success changes as you go through different levels? Mm -hmm. Good question. And Blackline, I don't think there's a more important subject within Blackline sales organization than our forecasting. It's where we put uh, more time face-to-face uh, -face in virtual world uh, almost every day. We're, mm -hmm. we're at some point having a conversation, whether it's a sales rep to the frontline management, it's frontline management to my level, it's my level up above, uh, or a combination of, of all of those. So the depth at which we are forecasting, it goes all the way from you know, field reps up to the chief revenue officer. Uh, and of course, he's sharing information with the CEO. So the CEO is certainly depending on accuracy of our forecast and, and uh, a deep knowledge of what's happening in our forecast at a deal level um, all the way through. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that's answering your question, but it's, it's, it's very deep and it's very frequent. I'll say that. Mm -hmm. Okay, right. So who do you think the, um, has the greatest influence on your forecast? Because it seems like it goes quite deep. Um, and do you think this person, this type of person, has always had that influence? Well, I'd like to say that the deepest or the most influence comes from me. Uh, mm -hmm. But I honestly feel it's not a person as it is. Uh, it's the ground level, the groundswell of our reps. Mm. that actually have the most influence. And I think, you know, if I broke it apart, it's like, okay, if I'm not setting the stage appropriately, if I'm not giving them clear expectations. So in this scenario, I should have most influence. Mm -hmm. If I'm setting the stage appropriately and they completely understand my expectations and the company's expectations, then I do have a, a great amount of influence on what happens. The flip of that is as a volume of people uh, creating inputs of forecasts, the sales team at the ground level has the most because it's, you know, for every one GVP at my level, there's roughly four regional or four frontline managers. For every, you know, for every one frontline manager, there's, you know, six to nine sales reps. Hmm. So, you know, I have roughly 30 uh, folks in my organization. If I haven't set the bar or the expectations appropriately, I have roughly 25 people at the ground level that are all adding in inputs in an incorrect way. And so I think in that fashion, uh, if I'm not setting, a, setting the bar right, that 25 to one, 25 of them to one of me has a severe impact and influence as to what's going out the door at the end of the day. Hmm. 
I like what you mentioned there, Larry, because it's very easy to kind of think it's the sales team, it's the reps, they're not submitting the right numbers. But if you as a leader aren't setting a process and ensuring that accountability, making sure that you're following these rules, then the forecasts aren't going to be accurate. So I love that. Okay, so Larry, how long do you think it took you to get to your current forecasting world? And, you know, if you had to do anything again, what would you say you would redo? Anything you'd do from scratch? Well, the, um, you know, as we had spoken offline before, mm-hmm. Joseph, I've been in my role, this role here for three years. The first year, it was quite a change for me because, um, you know, I've done a lot of, you know, forecasts as a salesperson. I've done a lot of forecasts as a frontline manager, but getting into the next level, it's it's another level removed from the actual sales, uh, the ongoing conversation and sales cycles with individual opportunities. Mm-hmm. And so being another level removed makes it all the more difficult to accurately forecast. So, you know, first year was getting used to uh, my position and, you know, the, the primary importance of what I'm to do and forecasting was part of that. Mm-hmm. The second year was really, we needed to increase the average uh, annual contracted value we were getting per opportunity. Uh, so that was a major focus there and it wasn't forecasting. This year, it's back to forecasting again, and uh, I would say we're much tighter uh, in our predictability, and we're much tighter as an organization to communicate and to understand the language at which we speak to and fro, like between first level to all the way up to the CRO, in fact. Mm -hmm. Uh, And starting from scratch, you know, I'd spoken before about the book of business review process. That has been a game changer. in my ability to communicate and to share not secondhand, but firsthand information. Um, And I should say even thirdhand, because if it's a rep is in a deal and they're Mm -hmm. sharing it with an RVP or a frontline manager who's not in the deal, that's first line. Then the the RVP is sharing it with me as a a second round of of sharing of information. And it's kind of like the game of telephone. It's very easy to get that message messed up and Mm -hmm. not have it be accurate. And so how how you get that and how frequently you get it uh, and how accurate it is are all super critical to this. Mm. So, Larry, do you think there's anything you would have changed if you could just start the process again? Um, Something that I would change. I I mean, like I say, I I think including this Bob review and the the summary forecasts, Mm -hmm. Those are the things that I have added into my processes in 2021 that I haven't ever had before, mm. 20 or before that. And they've, they've, they've brought a lot of robust uh, communications to uh, our environment. So mm. beyond now, no, I, I, I think I'm in a really good spot. And I think as we transition from 2021 here in the next three and a half months or so uh, into 2022, uh, as of this moment, I would stick with what I've got, to be quite honest. That's great. Okay. So final question for you, Larry. So as you know, with the forecasts, there's a lot of people involved. There's a lot of humans and we're very resistant to change. What mm-hmm. would you say the key considerations are for adoption of a new process? Number one is setting clear expectations for your mm-hmm. team. Uh, number two is getting the team buy-in, making sure that they know that their voice is important. So at the end of the day, we have very specific things that we want to accomplish with a certain project. In this case, a new, uh, different process of forecasting. Mm -hmm. However, it doesn't mean that I have to be the dictator of exactly how that runs. So from a sales rep perspective and an RVP or a frontline management perspective, what are their advices? What are their pieces of information that helps them feel like I've got a voice in the matter and upper management cares about my thoughts and how this runs? And then last but not least is I think that we follow up and that we put metrics around it. So Mm -hmm. it's always the case that if you're you're not measuring things, it, it may not be important enough. 
And so this is a super important piece of a sales you know, uh, operation. And mm -hmm. so from my perspective, number one is bringing in the dollars, but then number two is predicting like when, when and how much are you bringing in? So I, that's where I think, um, you know, if we're talking about forecasts and human, mm -hmm. human effort and key considerations of driving adoption, those three things are huge. Uh, mm -hmm. In the black line world, we've had, I would say like this year, the book of business reviews have been an encouragement to the process because it's a week in week out conversation. Mm -hmm. It breaks down barriers where I'm having virtual, but still direct conversations with my team. And on a one-on-one -on -one basis, you may have three or four different opportunities. You get to prioritize those opportunities. You get to talk to the progress of those opportunities. You get to explain the risk at which we're still sitting in those opportunities and you get to share what your proposals are of getting around those risks. And mm -hmm. I get to listen, I get to provide feedback, I get to help you brainstorm. And together, I think we walk away, we go through another week and we come back at the end of that week in our next Bob review and mm -hmm. you share what's your next progress? What are the new risks? How are we progressing? What are the issues that we're still involved in? And so I think this... Uh, repetition and open conversation and breaking down barriers and, and removal of fear in the process are all very key to uh, creating a really strong adoption.